All right, hi, and thank you for joining me, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, we're gonna switch gears, we're gonna talk about top-down uh, mass spectrometry and about the development of an informatic platform that can be used to characterize multi-proteiform complexes. So before we go into too much detail, we first need to understand exactly what a multi-proteiform complex is. So, what is a proteiform? A proteiform is a term that was developed to describe protein complexity. It can include the canonical sequence, post-translational modifications, endogenous proteolysis, alternative splicing, isoforms, natural variants, coding SMPs, mutations, and combinations of these features. So naturally, a multi-proteiform complex is, quite simply put, a complex composed of multiple proteiforms. It can be homomeric in nature, heteromeric in nature, and using the approach that we've developed, we can fully characterize a whole set of related multi-proteiform complexes, or we can use just a handful of proteiforms to partially characterize a multi-proteiform complex. It's important to note that because this is all top-down um, and the platform that we've developed, we can have proteiform uh, resolution. And so just like I previously described on the last slide, that includes things like post-translational modifications. So in the Kelleher group, um, we perform native mass spectrometry for the intact analysis of complexes. So there are plenty of different methods that you can use to perform complex analysis, but typically it starts out by identifying a complex of interest. From there, um, one of the first steps is to simplify your sample. So you can do this using a whole host of different fractionation techniques. But depending on what technology you use, you may end up running into issues with sample complexity as a result of high background or nonspecific binding. And depending on the instrument that you use, you may end up running into issues uh, concerning a loss of information with the stoichiometry, post-translational modifications, and cofactors. So we've developed a pipeline that um, can largely bypass a lot of these limitations, and that is our native mass spectrometry approach. And our approach begins with native extraction. So generally what we do is we use a hypotonic solution to induce cellular swelling, and that's followed by mechanical disruption to lyse the cells. From there, the proteins are um, fractionated to make a simplified sample using a technique just like um, I previously showed, using either clear native gel-free or ion exchange chromatography. From there, we analyze those fractions using native mass spectrometry. The instrument that we use is a modified Q Exactive HF with a quadrupole mass filter that is capable of transmitting and isolating higher M over Z species. We use a three tier approach. In the first, we um, analyze the full intact complex. And so that's uh, visualized here. So just to reiterate, we have our MS1, which refers to our full intact complex. From there, we can isolate a single charge state of the complex activate the complex, eject monomers, and detect the monomers, which is represented here. So our MS2 refers to the analysis of ejected monomers. In our third tier, we go ahead and we activate the complex, eject the monomers, isolate a single charge state of the monomer, fragment the monomer, and detect the fragment ions. And so this is our MS3. So once again, just to reiterate all of that, we have our MS1, which refers to our intact complex, our MS2, which refers to our ejected monomers, and our MS3, which refers to our fragment ions. In the final step of our native mass spectrometry approach, we have the discovery phase. And this we use a combination of tools, including ProSite PC 4.0, as well as the search engine for multi-proteiform complexes, the latter of which is what I'll be primarily speaking on for the duration of this talk. So our search engine for multi-proteiform complexes is a web-based tool that can be found at complexsearch.kelleher.northwestern.edu. It's a really straightforward um, platform that requires just a handful of information, including the intact complex average mass, so this is from the MS1, the subunit average mass, which is from the MS2, and the fragment ion monoisotopic masses, which is from our MS3 experiment. So once you go ahead and you submit the search, um, the search takes place in four major steps. In the first step, we create a database. So first, I'm going to talk about the development of this quorum proteiform database. And both of our databases, the quorum proteiform and the quorum MPC database, use existing databases. And for this, we use the SwissProt database, which is the manually curated protein entries from the Uniprot knowledge base, as well as quorum. And for anyone who may not be um, as familiar with quorum, 
Quorum is a database that contains manually annotated protein complexes from mammalian organisms. So the way that we develop our Quorum proteiform is we first start with these, um, a set of Swiss prop proteins. From there, we filter these proteins using the Quorum database to generate a list of proteins that are both Quorum entries and Swiss prot entries. From there, we proteiform expand this list of proteins to include all possible proteiforms. And that makes up our Quorum proteiform database. So right here, we have a Quorum proteiform database that contains over 9 million proteiform entries. So in our second step, what we use is the MS2 data. So this is our ejected monomer data. And our MS3 data, which is our fragment ion data for our ejected monomer, we can search this data using our Quorum proteiform database to identify a specific proteiform. In the next step, um, we use the other database, which is the Quorum MPC database. And it's generated on the fly using the proteiform that was identified in step two. So this proteiform is used to filter the quorum database um, for the interacting partners and the isoforms for that specific proteiform. From there, we can expand um, to include all possible stoichiometries, and that makes up our quorum MPC database. So it's important to note that although our quorum proteiform database is relatively static in size, our quorum MPC database uh, can greatly vary depending on the proteiform that was identified in step two. So step three then uses the proteiform information from step two in conjunction with the MS1 values, which is the intact mass of your um, full intact complex. And this data is then uh, searched using the Quorum MPC database to generate a list of candidate MPCs. In the final step, those candidate MPCs are then scored and ranked. So let's talk a little bit more about that scoring system. So we've developed an MPC score, which refers to a multiproteiform complex score, and it's based on a Gaussian distribution. It takes into consideration the complex posterior probability, which is defined as the complex likelihood of a candidate MPC divided by the sum of the complex likelihood for all candidate MPCs that were interrogated. And the complex likelihood is defined as the MS1 likelihood multiplied by the proteiform likelihood. So for um, I guess in layman's terms, we're taking into consideration the MS2 and MS3 data as well as the MS1 data. Specifically, we're focused on the delta mass, which is the theoretical mass of the candidate MPC um, minus the observed mass, so what we observed using mass spectrometry. In addition, we're taking into consideration the total number of candidate MPCs because as we increase the total number of MPCs, we're also going to increase our sum of the complex likelihoods and in turn decrease the MPC scores for all candidate MPCs that were interrogated. So for more information about um, our MPC score and the development of this pipeline, I would like to direct you to our most recent publication in Nature Methods, Skinner et al. in 2016. But let's move on to a fictitious example. So here we have two complexes, or these are candidate MPCs, rather. It's an alpha-beta-gamma complex and an alpha-alpha-alpha complex. If we were to input this comp or these complexes into our um, system and score these, we would find that the alpha-beta-gamma complex has an MPC score of 35 and a delta mass of plus one Daltons. And this is in comparison to our alpha-alpha-alpha complex, which has a MPC score of 1 times 10 to the negative 3 and a delta mass of 800 Daltons. So the take-home message here is the higher the MPC score and the lower the delta mass, the more confident you can be in your candidate MPC and the assignment of your candidate MPC. So if you remember, just on the last slide, we talked about increasing the total number of candidate MPCs and decreasing the overall MPC score. So if we add two additional MPCs, or Canada MPCs, this alpha gamma gamma and the alpha beta beta complex, what you can see is what used to be a high score or a high MPC score of 35 now is a MPC score of 4. Um, and of course, the uh, delta mass remains the same. So again, this is the highest score with the lowest um, delta mass. So now that you have a better understanding of how we uh, developed and can use our uh, pipeline, let's walk through a real example. So here we have the intact complex of the TNH complex. We go through and we isolate a single charge state of the complex, and we can activate the complex and inject monomers. So what we see here is that this is a heteromeric complex composed of 
three monomers um, here in red, blue, and purple. All of these are isotopically resolved. And once again, we can go through and isolate a single charge state for one of the monomers, fragment that, and then input all of this data into our online search tool. So once we hit search, the output um, that is generated includes a bunch of different information, some of which is proteiform specific. So here we have the identified proteiform, which in this case is the TNH alpha subunit. We have a p-score for that proteiform, an e-value, which is the expectation value, and the c-score, which is a characterization score that is specific for the proteiform. In addition, we have the MPC metrics, which is the quorum ID, the complex name. In this case, it's the TNH complex the stoichiometry, which is based on the masses. And um, although these accession numbers probably don't mean a lot to you right now, um, this is a alpha 2, beta 2, gamma 2, or at least that's what our search um, generated. We have an MPC score of 81 and a delta mass of 85, which corresponds with the addition of a cobalt and oxygen. So once we have all of this information, we can go ahead and repeat the process with the remaining monomers. So here we've got the uh, red and the blue, which correspond to the TNH uh, beta subunit and the TNH gamma subunit. So once we go through, we can search this um, in our pipeline and determine that, in fact, the stoichiometry for each one of these monomers did come back as an alpha 2, beta 2, gamma 2, which does correspond with uh, published literature. Again, we have a delta mass of 85, that remains constant, and an average MPC score of 81. So we're in an informatics um, discovery group. And so if you're interested in developing um, or characterizing new complexes, we have a feature that you can use for that, and it's the Add New Complex tool. And for this, the only bit of additional information that you need is a Uniprot accession. So let's walk through um, the characterization of a new complex. So here we have an intact um, complex with a total mass of 9,872 Daltons. To date, it's one of the smallest complexes that we've uh, identified. We go ahead and we isolate a single charge state. We can eject the monomers. Um, here we have residual precursor, and we have the monomers which correspond with that 4 plus and 3 plus charges. The subunit is 4,935 Daltons. We can go ahead and isolate a single charge state of the monomer, fragment the monomer, and then what we do is we take this information and put, plug it into ProSite PC. So we can set up an experiment there that uses the uh, monomer mass as well as the fra fragment ion monoisotopic masses and we can search this data and determine what the specific proteiform is. In this case, it's thymosin beta 10, um, and the proteiform has the initiator methionine removed and has a N-terminal acetylation. But the information that's really important for our next step is this accession number here, P63313. So now we have all of the information that we need for a um, discovery step. And so, we have our MS1 value, so our intact complex, we have our ejected monomer, we have our fragment ions, and we have a proteiform. And so we can go ahead and input all of this into our search engine for multi-proteiform complexes and determine that this is indeed a thymosin beta 10 complex. It's a homodimer. This is information that was very clear from um, that first step, where, or the first and second step where we eject the monomers. But what our online search tool can do is tell you what the delta mass is. Again, this is the theoretical mass minus the observed mass. So we observe a zero Dalton difference, and we have an outstanding MPC score of 1,323. So using this pipeline, we've been able to uh, characterize a whole host of protein complexes from both human and non-human sources. But what's been really cool are the modifications that we're observing. These modifications that are highlighted here in gold are cysteine modifications. And so it's um, not necessarily what we had expected, being that the vast majority of the literature talks about internal acetylations and methylation events. And so this has been one of our um, neat findings. But additionally, what we've also observed are trends with the um, gas phase fragmentation propensities. And so not all amino acids uh, cleave the same. And so what we did was we plugged this into a heat map. But before we go into the data of the heat map, let's talk a little bit first about how we interpret this heat map. So 
we have on the x-axis the C-terminal side of the fragmentation event, which is here. And on the y-axis, we have the N-terminal side of the fragmentation event, which is here. So if we were looking at this specific um, cleavage, this would be a V cleavage P. And so if we were to assume a uniform distribution, um, given that we're observing just over 3,000 fragmentation events, we would assume that uh, we would observe eight events for each one of these amino acid pairs. And that's actually what this heat map represents right now. But what we actually observe is incredible heterogeneity ranging from zero cleavage events, which is highlighted here in blue, all the way up to and beyond 64 cleavage events, which is eight times the um, anticipated likelihood of observing that. So if I can have you focus in on just three amino acids, we have the aspartic acid on the N-terminal side of a cleavage event and our proline and glycine on the C-terminal side of the fragmentation event. What this makes up is over 55% of the um, total fragmentation events. So just over 1,500 uh, fragmentation events are just these three amino acids, which is really neat. Um, and this type of information is incredibly valuable as we move into improving our MPC score because if we go back to our MPC score, we take into consideration this MS2 and MS3 data. But what I didn't mention is that this actually takes into consideration our characterization score, or C-score. And so if we can add this new knowledge about gas phase fragmentation propensities, we can in turn improve our C-score, which will then improve our MPC score. So, in summary, I've walked you through our native proteomics pipeline. I've introduced you to our search engine for multi-proteiform complexes. Uh, walked you through a handful of examples, in particular this TNH complex and the thymus and beta-10 complex. At the very beginning, the example was our GAP-DH complex. And now I have just a couple of quick plugs. If you're interested in um, new instrumentation that can be used for intact proteomics, our intact complex analysis, I would like to direct you to Mikhail Belov's talk on Wednesday at 310. If you're interested in a improved FDR scoring system for um, top-down proteomics, uh, I'd like to direct you to Rich LeDuc's talk on Thursday. And if you're interested in how we've been able to apply this entire talk, or this entire uh, pipeline, to the discovery and characterization of endogenous complexes, I'd like to direct you to Owen Skinner's talk on Wednesday. And with that, I'd like to say thank you, especially to our collaborators at Thermo Fisher Scientific, Drs. Beloff, Horning, and Makarov, and our funding from the Keck Foundation. And because this is a very collaborative product, or project, I'd like to make a quick shout out to my colleagues, Owen Skinner, Luca Fernelli, Ryan Fellers, Joe Greer, Brian Early, and Phil Compton for making this possible. And last but not least, my postdoc advisor, Professor Neil Kelleher. So with that, I thank you. And if time allows, I'd be happy to take any questions. We have time for one or two questions. Uh, yeah, here I have an online question. So um, let me see. Yeah, can you submit um, several different MS3 spectra from diff uh, different monomer uh, monomers of a complex? Can we sum? Submit. Submit. Oh, submit. Um, actually, no, not at present, but that is a current direction that we are trying to take this project. And so it's something that we will plan on accounting for in maybe a second release. Okay. Yeah, I have another question. Okay. So, um, so what is the max, uh, maximum mass shift do you allow in searching your complex mass against this? Uh, the precursor mass. So we allow um, users to submit their own tolerances, and so typically we have a very wide tolerance for our MS1 and MS2, so we can account for um, unexpected post-translational modifications, which is how we identified so many of the cysteine modifications. But when it comes to the MS3 values, we um, do not have a lot of wiggle room. Typically we set that at 15 parts per million. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah.